Hi everyone. I was in the wrong group apparently, but I think I'm in the right uh, transmission group now. So I hope you can hear me and uh, looking forward to answering your questions. Julie's here. Hello, Julie. Wendy's here. I'm in the right group, Wendy. Well done. Hi, Doug. Hi, Judy. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Marie. Hi, Catherine. Linda. Ah, oh, such a pleasure. Hi, Tiffany. Carrie. Elizabeth. That's like a great party, isn't it? Everybody's turning up. Leah. Everybody's there. Anders, Desiree, Tammy, wow, Heather, excited to see you too. All right. If anybody hears any strange noises, um, we've had a 40 person uh, video crew in the house today uh, filming a pop video and they're just still clearing up now. So there shouldn't be any more noises, but if you hear anything strange, that's what it is. Hi Bailey, hi Guillermo, and Sue. Melinda, that's the technical expertise we need joining the group. And Sarah, hi. Yeah, it was, it was fun actually. I was out for most of the day, but um, came back and there was just the usual uh, uh, carnage of <laughs> when you have so many people and so much equipment coming in for the day. Uh, but it's one of the reasons actually, to be honest with you, I can live in such a nice house is but we, we rented out a lot to um, film crews and things. And uh, some of the people in the group will know that I live at the top of the Santa Monica Mountains. So it's a beautiful view and um, it's a great location for uh, people who want to film or uh, do promos. Hey, Meline, Linda. All right. Oh, filming the sequel to The Tenth Kingdom. <laughs> you can tell us, I, I promise you. <laughs> Desiree, if we were filming the sequel to The Tenth Kingdom, you guys would be the first to know. I've been trying to uh, pull off that particular trick for a very long time, and um, I will never give up, but we're not quite there yet. Um, that'd be great. Actually, it wouldn't be a bad location to film uh, uh, a sequel to The Tenth Kingdom up here with all the mountains and the ocean and everything. All the secrets, asks Elizabeth. Are we going to get all the secrets? Well, you probably get some of the secrets. I'm not sure about all of them. Oh, I pronounced your name right, Malene. Oh, oh thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to hearing all your questions, but you've got to remember too that you probably know the series better than I do. People are always like saying some continuity thing or something and they say, well, why, why, why was that bag there in that scene and not there in that scene? And I'm like, I don't know. Ah, oh, Sarah, in film school now. Oh, well done. Hope to work with you one day. What are you uh, uh, specializing in, Sarah? What's your area of interest in filmmaking? Danielle says, hi, Scott. <laughs> That's, I don't look like a wolf, do I? Uh, I think so. I can't see or hear anything. Is there, way, is there a way to fix it? Ah, but I guess, can other people hear me? Could somebody say yes if you can hear me? That's all right, Danielle. I know you meant Simon. So I guess people can't hear me. Okay. Yes, good. All right.
If you were to film the sequel now, would it be a time jump 20 years in the characters' lives? Okay. Um, yes, it would. For the simple reason that I think this cast was so fantastic. I can't bear the idea. I mean, think about it, you know, supposing somebody else turned up and they were wolf. Ugh. I mean, if, if they were wolf as a child or something, yes. Or, you know, Virginia, yes, but not for me, just other uh, actors playing the parts. So um, uh, we've been trying to set up the sequel for a long time. And, and my idea for this is precisely that we would jump in time, that we would perhaps not bring it right up to the present day, but um, virtually the present day. And um, of course, that would mean, given the ending of the first series, that we would be dealing with uh, uh, the idea of um, a young adult now as a wolf and Virginia's child. So uh, um, that would be very exciting. One second, I'm just going to talk to the film crew because they're still talking out there. Sam? Can you keep everybody quiet, please? I'm speaking live on video. Thanks. Uh, there you go, I told them all to be quiet because I was speaking live. Um, yeah, so uh, I definitely, I just, I would feel very uncomfortable, I think, about kind of messing about with the, the characters. Um, I just felt that really everybody, not just the big parts, but the small parts were so nice. Um, so right from the beginning, when I was talking about doing a, a second and, and indeed third and fourth series, uh, I was always thinking, well, what's happened to Acorn and what's happened to Prince Wendell and all that. So um, although we would introduce some new characters and we do, I would very much want to uh, take you through with that story and, and tell you what was happening to uh, all the people and what had happened in between. And I think that's kind of a fun thing. It's actually quite a fairy story thing, a fairy tale thing in a way that because like people go to sleep for 20 years and things like that. So um, that would all be exciting. Let me have a look, see what else. Um, all right. Scott will always be our wolf. Yeah, he'll always be my wolf. I really, I would just struggle. You know, I've talked before um, to people about the audition and um, some characters, you know, okay, the actor's not brilliant and the character's fine, the story still works. If someone isn't convincing as a character like wolf, half human, half wolf, the whole thing falls apart. If you have some actor, and believe me, in the auditions, we saw a lot of those actors who were trying to act that animal stuff, then it, it really unpicks at the, your whole, the whole credibility of the piece. So it was fantastic for me, um, the moment when uh, Scott walked in, I thought, this is Wolf and this always will be Wolf. Oh yes, Scott will always be a Wolf, okay. Um, no, I really wouldn't want to recast. I would rather come up with some story for what's happened to individual characters than actually just replace them with someone else. Uh, Kelsey, my mum introduced us kids to the 10th Kingdom when we were little. We all absolutely loved it and passed it on to our kids. I tell everyone I can about it. I absolutely do love Wolf. Yes. Would Wolf and Virginia have a boy or a girl? Okay, spoiler alert. They have a girl. I did refer at the end of the first series to uh, a little chap growing inside you. Uh, chap, maybe for me as an Englishman as well, means something slightly different. But it's like when uh, Americans say the guys, you know, it's sort of usually refers to men, but it doesn't always. And I have to tell you that the child they had was a rather difficult girl child. Um, anyway, uh, why did Virginia's mother try to drown her? Ooh, that's a big question. I really don't want to give a glib answer to that. I mean, there are no exact answers to things. And, and that's in a way why fairy tales exist, I think. Extraordinary things happen in fairy tales, extraordinary acts of cruelty and inhumanity um, and I could give you some psychological spiel about you know her mother was mentally disturbed and this and that and everything but in a way I just I, I'm trying to forge a connection between 
our world, the so-called real world, and this world of the stories that we're told as children. And I, if I had the chance to write a lot more scenes where we saw a psychiatrist who was, you know, seeing Virginia's mother or something like that, we could perhaps explain it in more psychological terms. But I really don't. I just want to say to you that I hope at the end of that 10 hours, that story is uh satisfying for you so that you don't feel cheated and you don't think well that was weird you know but you understand that virginia is play coming from a place of extreme hurt and um extreme trauma uh, of which she's tried to cover up and uh, again i've talked about this a little bit before but that's the beauty for me of having 10 hours it's like a big novel or something you can just let little bits come out and I, I don't think in my experience people necessarily talk directly about those things. They talk about them more in code and more in story and, and metaphor and things like that. So when Virginia talks about, uh, you know, all she says is I felt like I was in a train crash, you know, and, and, and nobody came to rescue me. And I don't know why, but I can remember now the moment when I was writing that and I just thought, that's enough. Stop there. Don't don't try and explain everything just try and make this connection with people and i hope that those people uh, you know and there, there are many of us who, who have you know experienced things that are very difficult to process i hope it's satisfying for them i've kind of dodged the question but i i hope you feel that was satisfying um okay the cast seemed like the po perfect cohesive family. <laughs> they were, but filming is always hard. And um, of course, uh, most of our cast were, not most, but most of the principals were Americans. So they were a long way from home. And I think it was a difficult shoot for, for people, just the length of it. Um, but at the same time, I hope going to such amazing locations and places was good. Um, uh, I, I think there was a, a, a good, you know, kinship and, and support amongst people. Um, have Daniel says, have you written it yet with that time jump? What I've done is um, I've written a, a quite a long treatment, like a ten-page uh, uh, document that outlines how a second series would play out, um, and I also started writing a novel. Uh, um, because it felt to me like I wanted to just get into it somehow and um, and plan out how it was. So m my idea was that we could simultaneously have a Tenth Kingdom 2 book and a TV series. Um, a lot of people over the years have said, well, if you can't, you know, I don't have the rights to make a, a TV series. I have to persuade other people to do that. I don't own those rights myself. And they said, well, why don't you just write a book and then, you know, blah, 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 it will all unfold. Unfortunately, they control all the rights. So I can't just, you know, write a book. Um, I, I don't actually own the rights in my characters anymore, which is what makes it so difficult um, to sort of set that process going. And it's always a bit of a catch-22 because somebody would say, well, if there was a book and, you know, you'd sold lots of copies, then maybe we'd do a TV series. And I'm like, well, let me do a book. But they say, well, we don't want to do a book until we commit to a TV series. So it's, it's very difficult to get around that. And actually, that's why a lot of, I'm sure you've all seen a lot of programs and movies and things, and you think, well, that was really great. Why didn't they ever make a sequel? Sometimes they've really been trying very hard, but there's just a series of, of, of factors that make it difficult to do that. Um, and also ownership passes on from one company to another. So when uh, I originally made The Tenth Kingdom, it was with Robert Halmy Sr., um, who I really, you know, had a lot of uh, admiration for as a, as a producer. And uh, we got on really well. And, you know, he let me kind of do what I wanted in a way with, with Tenth Kingdom. Um, but now all the, the uh, library for the catalogue um, uh, for Hallmark has been sold on. So um, it's a new company, Sonar, that actually owns the rights. And they, of course, don't have the history or they're not invested in the, in the series in the same way. Okay. Um, Scott is brilliant, says Desiree. Yes, he is, isn't he? Isn't he? Isn't he brilliant? It, 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 I can't tell you. If, if you write a book, then you've written a novel, and some people will read it, and you hope that uh, even if they make a film and the film's not great, they can always go back to that novel. And that was their first 
uh, understanding and appreciation of that world so they will have imagined that character but when i write a screenplay nobody reads it unless it gets made no, no members of the general public so the first time that something happens i'm sure there have been a number of screenplays that were really brilliant and they just got kind of cast wrong or directed wrong or it didn't quite work so um although there are many many brilliant uh, uh, actors in the 10th kingdom i think for me the linchpin of it the whole reason that it, it, it works so well is because scott has that range as an actor um and uh i, I just he, he just got it um michaela this movie is a classic and will live forever thank you well i think the fact that we're still talking about it 19 years on is fantastic and there have been lots of um other similar kind of things this genre has come back in um i think in many ways 10th kingdom was a little bit ahead of of the curve um but even though we've seen so many spins on you know the once upon a time things and grim and everything like that um i think there's still a, a sense in which people understand that the 10th kingdom was was really a bit different um and i i, I think that's why it's lasted and, and why people feel, still feel so strongly um about it i don't look at lots of other things and think oh yeah that's just like the 10th kingdom even if they're telling the same stories they tend to go off in in different directions if uh chelsea if the unfortunate happens and a sequel isn't picked up for tv would you be willing to publish sequels as a book series well as i said i literally don't have the power to do that um but uh, that doesn't mean i've given up doing that and um you may still be able to persuade them to take that first step and say we'll just release the rights to us um so we'll see um uh desiree what is wolf half of a werewolf uh, a wolf shifter a rougarou uh, uh, uh okay this is all terminology isn't it from um i don't know underworld or something um i don't know i just thought that um this was somebody who was fundamentally a human but they lived their life as though they were an animal that's kind of just all i got really um so i just started to think about so so wolf for me is, is we say he's half wolf half human i think he's he's much more sort of functioning than 50 50. i think that most of the time you see him he can get away with being human it's only when he's asked to process something or discuss his emotions or breakfast <laughs> or something like that that he just gets carried away and i i kept thinking of um because most of us don't have experience of wolves i didn't unfortunately i couldn't go and live with a, a, a wolf pack for for years but dogs those kind of descendants um they show you some of those uh, uh characteristics and so when i was writing it i was always thinking okay we're having uh, breakfast what's it like if the dog is having breakfast it's different isn't it or if the dog's looking at your sandwich thinking mm, i would like that so for me there was always this little i go through that with all the characters i write really as i just try and make some shift from myself i don't lose myself entirely I'm not just trying to make something up i try and take a bit of myself into it but at the same time i I'm looking for something that's just a little alien to me. So pretty much I was always thinking, what would a dog do? You know, what, how would a dog feel? And if some, you know, if you say, I love you to a dog and your dog could talk, your dog wouldn't say, yeah, I love you too. Your dog would go. <laughs> it was the most amazing, wonderful thing in the world to be able to tell you how much he or she loved you. Okay uh jessica hello simon i can't listen right now but i just wanted to say thank you for this amazing story it's been my favorite since i first saw it when i was 13 14 years old i'll be 33 in may ah uh, thank you that's also a lovely thing isn't it um and I, I think that a television series like the 10th kingdom it arrived just at the right time insofar as there were vhs's dvds streaming um 
it, it's meant that people, if you say now, uh, Tenth Kingdom's great, okay, it's not on TV, but you can find it very quickly. So this idea that people watched it when they were teenagers, say now they're grown up and they're still watching it, or they might show it to their children or you know their family. That's a beautiful thing for me. Uh, Athena, absolutely satisfying film. It's beautifully made. Yes, it is beautifully made, and I can say that because that's that's nothing to do with me. Just to, that was what was so exciting for me is that I realised at some level that this was going to be made at scale you know quite often things especially if they're a little bit different you end up with half the money and half the time to shoot it and the all those locations wouldn't have been there you know those effects wouldn't have been there i could have still kept the heart of the series but when we said magic we wouldn't necessarily be able to show you uh those those visual effects and um one of the things i love for me is that even 19 years on with this tremendous evolution of uh, uh, computer generated images and things it still looks good for me when the huntsman's tree uh, opens up I still have this little wow moment you know or when um, Virginia Woolf put on the shoes and you know it, it wasn't just the sort of um, the fact that we had money I think is that the money was used in a very imaginative way so those effects are um, really beautiful for me um, Elizabeth says, I could see their daughter, uh, Wolf of Virginia, as being the ultimate problem child. Yes, you bet. <laughs> if you think Wolf was a problem in Tenth Kingdom, then uh, I think you would find that uh, their, their daughter was <laughs> much worse. Uh, Jessica, I think Virginia's childhood spoke to those who went through similar issues with absent parents. Yep. Uh, Malene, this is this movie is what gave me the itch to travel to Europe. Yeah, that's a nice thing as well for me doing something that was essentially an American series. It was originally um, uh, set in uh, uh, London, not New York. But um, as Europeans, you're relatively used to in you know big budget television and spy dramas and things like that you sort of see europe but in america almost everything that's shot is shot in america so um it'd be quite hard in a way if you had to shoot the fairy story kingdoms in california say you know california is an amazing dramatic landscape but it doesn't have those castles it doesn't have all that stuff so you know i, I think that's that was just an amazing thing for me you really get a sense of a great epic journey um, uh, across you know several countries as people probably know we shot in um, would you consider uh, the ice queen being in the next one um, I did map out very 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 um, briefly the idea of a, a whole like eight series um, and uh, wanted to um, do something I, I did an adaptation for Hallmark of the Snow Queen which is a story I really like Hans Christian Andersen not uh, the Brothers Grimm but uh, I think that uh, uh, yes I would like to go to that kingdom but um, not just yet that would have to be several series on I think um, Jessica Ball, I just wanted to add that I tell everyone I know about this mini-series. It's often one of the first things I ask new people. I even asked my now husband the first time we met, and you would not believe how surprised I was when he told me he'd seen it. Harry, uh, how do you feel, Elizabeth, how do you feel about people writing fan fiction in your world? Um, I've been asked this before. I, I mean, I, I'm really happy that fan fiction exists and it's very flattering that people, you know, love your world or your characters so much that they want to write it. But for me as a, um, as a creative person, I just, I don't want to read it. It's no disrespect to the people who are doing it. It's just that it's like some parallel universe, you know, mm -hmm. setting off in, in your head and, um, uh, also supposing they come up with some really good ideas and then I want to steal them or there's some ideas I've already thought of and you know so um, it, it's not something for me really I, I just 
I can't, I can't go near it um, uh, just because it might mess with my head. Um, Tiffany, do you keep in touch with the cast? Um, not really, no, apart from Scott. Scott, I do keep in touch with. I mean, uh, as people know, we've been trying to set up a series, but um, series two, but um, also he's just such a nice guy. And when he comes over to LA, we, uh, uh, we always uh, meet up. Um, but otherwise, no, probably not with the cast. Um, I would love to, though. I'd love to see uh, Kimberly again. You know, I've talked a lot about Wolf, and, and he often does get, you know, a lot of the attention. Um, but, you know, all that would not work if it were not for the incredible uh, performance that Virginia gives. I mean, she takes an emotional line through the series and um such a fine actor really such such a, a clever actor and especially for me in the later parts of the story you know i think that w women have had a tough time in adaptations of fairy stories because the original meaning of them the darkness and the depth of them has been lost and so they're often reduced to playing silly princesses you know waiting for their prince and as people know that's not what the Tenth Kingdom is about and not what I'm interested in about. But to start out with, she's a really rather um, helpless character who's complaining a lot about her life and, you know, saying, why does nothing ever happen to me and, and all that stuff. So um, I love the evolution. I love seeing her, you know, grow as a person. And it's not, again, a sort of a, a, a token development, I think. It's not that at the end, you know, she takes some action or does this or takes charge or something like that. Her destiny leads her to uh, an appalling realization, really, which is that she has to kill the person she's been looking for, or at least kill, I mean, we're getting met metaphorical now, but, you know, g kill the thing that's been holding her back. Um, and so for me, I always, when I look at the series, I, I'm always thinking, wow, these two people, they're just anchoring it in such a beautiful, beautiful way. Um, Tammy, would you consider producing it with someplace like Netflix if that was a choice? Absolutely. I'd produce it with anybody who could um, uh, command the resources. Um, after we did the first series, about a couple of years afterwards, there was the opportunity to do a follow-up series, but we were told right up front um, we wouldn't have the money to do the effects we did before. There wouldn't be the money to shoot it all on locations in uh, Europe. Um, and we wouldn't be able to afford the um, uh, original cast. And I said no, because not because it, um, it was so worried about the scale of it, but just because I thought um, I, I don't want to do something which diminishes the first series. Um, but Netflix, in a way, now is the biggest player in town. And um, I, I think it would be fantastic to do a series like this uh, with them, especially because they tend to be hands off um, creatively when they like something, um, which wouldn't be the case, you know, again, if we did it with the studio and um, uh, network, then they would come in very heavily with ideas about who should be what. And then you get into that horrible world where people say, um, oh, yeah, it's great, but, you know, Scott Cohen's too old now to play Wolf. You know, let's get somebody younger or let's get somebody who's just been in this teen drama or something like that. And I always felt that we were lucky and we'd created something special and I don't want to dilute the brand. Um, okay. Where do, uh, Athena, where do you recommend purchasing a singing ring? Well, you've seen the store. You just you just go to Kissing Town. Yeah, to find a, a very special, you know, ring for a very special person. And um, let's hope that guy's sorted out the cuckoo clock problem. Okay, Jen says, "Love this show." Thank you, Jen. Um, Emma says, "Yes, I can't help but compare fantasies with the Tenth Kingdom, and I feel they all fall a bit short." Yeah, well, secretly, so do I. Um, was it difficult to get the original produced? All right, okay. I originally wrote the um, uh, uh, 
the project as a standalone movie and uh, almost got it made then and um, against the advice of my agent I, I turned down the chance to renew the option to make it as a movie and um, instead tried to develop it as a TV series. Um, I developed it uh, with uh, the BBC originally um, and so the our world part of it was set in London and uh, they went over to, tenth, uh, to the um, kingdoms uh, then I did Gulliver's Travels, um, a miniseries for um, Hallmark, which was hugely successful. And so that opened the door really um, to do the Tenth Kingdom. But each time each one of these stages happens, it's another immense reimagination of, of uh, you know, the whole thing. To turn something that was a, a two hour movie into a, what was at one point a 12 hour um, TV series, you know, it's an enormous job. So. It's been through many, many um, different forms. Um, I'm going to whiz through a little bit. Um, uh, Matthew, was it a deliberate choice for the evil queen to look like Queen Mary Tudor, or was it a coincidence? <laughs> coincidence. Um, uh, Athena, the music is brilliant. Yes, yes. Again, I think that what what happened was the piece was strong uh you know the performance of the actors were even at the rush stage so that means that you know when people came on board i think they really gave it their a game and they saw what we were trying to do and saw we were trying to do something that would be very memorable and um a lot of music and film and tv series for me is 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 not interesting you know, and same with the writing or the acting it's just procedural if you like it's just people turning up and doing that oh it's a fairy story so we'll do the strings and we'll do all that and um i think that the the music uh, in certain points just takes you somewhere different um will john larroquette at least make a cameo appearance in the sequel okay so my idea for the sequel I'm going to tell you a few little bits, but not much. Um, is that, as you know, he he made a terrible um, <laughs> he murdered a toad uh, uh, at the end of the first part, and the guild of toads, which is a very esteemed um, group of creatures in the kingdoms, takes this very badly, and their punishment um, <laughs> to John is to turn him into a toad. So, in the intervening twenty years. He has been guarding the royal um, dwarf uh, gold uh, vaults, but he has been spending his time as a as a toad, which is obviously not what he uh, he planned to do. Uh, can, uh, Danielle, can we get invitations to be extras in the sequel someday? Well, I want to say yes to everybody, but I, it's not in my power to promise those things. But depending on where we're shooting and what we're doing, I will try. And for all the people who've kept the flame alive over this years i'll see if there's one day where we can um get around rules it's also union things and things like that because i've done this before i say to somebody oh come on turn up and you can be in this thing but if you can we will and i'm sh I mean, i'm sure there's some opportunities there okay um Melinda, how much say did you have in casting the parts? Well, um, uh, a lot in terms of what really mattered, um, which for me was uh, Wolf and Virginia. And um, I went with the directors to New York, um, which is where we saw them both. There were some other parts which were really just cast because um, NBC wanted them in uh, the series. So if you look at the advertising, for instance, it's very heavy on Anne-Margaret, right? Anne-Margaret in the Tenth Kingdom. And 
I think some people, when they first trailed it, they were trailing all the stars, um, and as they saw them, who of course are not really the main characters in this. So of that, I had no control. Um, actually didn't have any control over uh, John Larroquette being cast. We were just told at some point he's playing Tony. There's quite a lot of, um, not bullying, but the network wants to make it clear, you know, that um, they need some names um, and that will override people uh, being famous. But what we fought for, and this in a way is what I would always do, is what I would call sort of smart casting is let them have their way with, you know, uh, uh, those parts. It doesn't really matter, to be honest, if Anne-Margaret plays Cinderella or not. Um, but really focus on saying, you know, we can't just cast somebody because they've, you know, they've come off being a, a mouseketeer in a Disney series or something. We need to get phenomenal actors to play these two um, early parts. So it's a really a mixture of having some control. Um, we had very good directors for the series, so um, uh, pretty much all the small parts that they cast, and I didn't have a lot of uh, in, influence on that. But um, I was certainly there at that moment of, um, of choosing who was gonna kind of carry our story. Um, as somebody like Diane uh, Wiest for me too is just someone I've always, always wanted to have in a piece of drama of mine. I mean, just phenomenal actor. Okay. Uh, Emma, I was around six when I first watched The Tenth Kingdom, wanted to be like Virginia. That was the first time I chopped all my hair off. Oh, and I've been doing it every few years since. I know I had my hair chopped off today. Maybe a bit too short. Might have been a result of watching The Tenth Kingdom. Um, Danielle, I can't point out one actor that I didn't believe. For a movie with so many characters, to see each and every one deliver a great authentic performance is so rare these days. Yeah. Um, when I do something, I have what I can call controlling ideas. You know, and in the same way I was just talking about casting, you have to let some things go because you just don't get your way on everything. But I feel like if you can make sure the controlling ideas work in a series, then you'll largely get what you want. And the controlling idea for me, and the thing I just walked around with all the scripts and kept saying to people is, don't play this like you're in a fairy story. You know, play it like you're in a psychologically real drama. And I said that to the uh, directors, and there's a difference in tone, and you may be able to notice that sometimes. Uh, 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 I've said this before, but for me, the series starts off and it's quite a broad tone in New York. I was worried that everybody was doing a little bit too flamboyant um, uh, kind of acting for me. Um, it, it's really important that you feel this is a real world and real people live there. Um, and by and large, that, that really worked. And I think, again, that's an advantage of the time is that the longer the series goes on and the more the actors are kind of comfortable in those roles, the more that they, they really... Um, uh, give intensely sort of psychological, psychologically real performances. Um, Liz, thank you for this lovely piece of fantasy. It means so much to me. Thank you, Liz. Uh, Kelsey, Virginia portrayed a woman growing confidence and self-acceptance so well. She was amazing. My favorite part of the movie is the hide and seek <laughs> scene because it was playful and real. Whereas Kissing Town had that added romantic atmosphere. Yeah, well, we've been talking about this a little a bit, a bit this week and, and erst and holding back on things. And um, I, I, I felt that, okay, it's the modern day. I didn't want to suggest that Wolf and Virginia would not have some kind of physical experience because I felt, especially in, the, in in all the life and death experiences they were having otherwise, um, it, it was different and it was appropriate for them to get to that place. On the other hand, I, I, sometimes it disappoints me that people just kind of move from A to Z in a relationship in a TV series. They meet each other and then suddenly, you know, everything's happening. So uh, it's a very slow burn. And it has to be because it comes from that place of mutual suspicion, not mutual suspicion, but, you know, Virginia is deeply suspicious of Wolf. And Wolf is deeply suspicious of himself and his own bad side and good side and instincts. So it all comes together around Kissing Town. 
and um, well, you know, there's that prolonged sequence where Wolf starts to talk to himself, and he says, "Maybe I'm good. Maybe I'm bad. You know, maybe I could do this." Maybe, you know? And and he's agonizing around that whole thing. So it's all building up to this um, uh, uh, emotional release when um, uh, uh, when Wolf rescues Virginia, and after that we're about to go into the final sequence and i just suddenly thought one day, you know uh, which is really action and drama and playing out the story between virginia and her mother and so i just thought maybe there's a a chance to have this little interlude in the forest gathering wood and i just i thought okay so the audience is going to realize when they go off that something's going to happen and they're going to enjoy that but then you get to this moment where they're both saying, well, you know, I mean, Mike, should we? And yeah, and she's saying, yeah, I, w I will. And I mean, he says, oh, great. I've always wanted to play hide and seek, you know. And I just thought that summed up for me both the childishness of him as, as a, a, in an appealing sense and the fact that he, st he just wanted to play, you know, in a way that animals want to play. And maybe that addresses that how much is he animal and how much is he human question. Ah, okay. Desiree, are there places in the kingdom where someone will let something look at the oven in terror and bring it out to the customer? Or was Wolf pulling the waitress's leg? <laughs> I just I was trying to come up with a phrase that would describe something so rare that you couldn't imagine it so you got rare you know pink in the middle bloody whatever and then i thought no wolf likes his meat so rare because he's an animal he doesn't really want to cook his shepherdess does he i mean so i just thought the idea of the chef taking the meat and holding it in front of the oven and saying ready well, that was funny how bad a crime is sheep worrying in the kingdom? So, oh, it's a big crime. Okay. Tiana, wait, is this real? Is this on now? Oh my God. Yes, it is. It's on. It's real. Honored to watch this. Honored to be with you. Okay. Uh, Daniel says, I'll join the union, the extras union, if I need to. Ha <laughs> ha. You may need to, but yes, you could do that. Oh my God, extras, I'd cry forever. All right. Mm. Okay, Tammy saying good night. Good night, Tammy. Tiana, you are really the father of modern fantasy. My husband and I were discussing this last night. Thank you so much, you're amazing. Thank you. Uh, Athena, I love the choice of Cameron Mannheim for Snow White. Yes, so do I. Now, actually, that was um, that that was a combination of my instinct. What I said was, Snow White might not have grown up to be, you know, a Botoxed sort of um, trying to be still ageless kind of person. Um, and NBC saying, well, we've got our stars in house and we've got, how do you feel about, you know, Cameron Mannheim? And I was like, fantastic. It's fantastic. And it's so in the spirit of the series, don't you? When you see that, it's one of those things for me where it's just so non-Hollywood. It's such a, it's, it's such an interesting trajectory that it, it, it takes you on um so I, I just yeah i love that casting and i thought she was terrific as well it, it's 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 like an alternative mother figure as well very important you know for virginia who doesn't have that mother figure who's looking for that um and can't get it you know from her father it never it can't even really get a sort of balance of male love in the normal sense from her father just because he's not equipped emotionally to give her that and again although the, the the stories and the situations are fantastical i think there's something that maybe resonates with people about that and so when um cameron comes in at that point um and it, just think about that too because i'm like delivering the scripts 
and uh, <laughs> saying, well, there's quite a long uh, speech um, from Snow White in, in the series, um, because everybody in TV wants everything to be short and fast and move on and everything. How long is the speech, Simon? Well, it's uh, seven pages long. So she just, you know, uh, I, it's my understanding that she said yes to the role before she'd even read the script. And I, I'm very happy about that. I just thought she was fantastic. Emma says, uh, also inspired by this show, uh, was my desire to act. I've been acting for the last 10 years now. Well done for you, Emma. Um, yep, Marie's saying um, how much she loved Diane Weist. Weist. Um, Tiana, what was your inspiration for writing The Tenth Kingdom? Um, I, um, I think of writing as a sort of 24 seven job. So I'm always writing down ideas or tearing things out that interest me. And I don't try too hard to think what they are or what they're going to develop into. I just kind of write them down and throw them in a box or put them in a, a, a digital file. And then every so often I go back to these and I look at it and it's like seeing your subconscious. It's actually a fantastic uh, uh, benefit of doing a job like writing is that I don't really think too much about why I'm doing something. I just think, does it keep coming back? So I'll have some ideas and I'll think, oh, I want to do something about a mission to Mars. And then I never really have that thought again. But when a thought keeps recurring to me, I think, hmm, this is something in your psyche. And the thought that came kept recurring to me was, when I was little, I was really frightened by these stories and I was really overwhelmed and, and went into that world. And if you read the stories to your children, you can still see that happening. But I didn't feel that as an adult, when an adaptation of Cinderella came on or something like that, I thought, oh, oh I love this. I, I felt a little bit like distanced from it. And so I thought, what would make that connection for adults? How could I draw adults as well as family, audience and children. How could I draw adults back into that world? And um, I just kept having this idea of fairy stories for adults and I tried various things, but they were all a bit too knowing and a bit too kind of clever and I wasn't really getting to the heart of what I thought these stories were about. Um, and then one day I was working on a different project and I was in LA and just killing some time in a, one of those big bookshops they used to have. and. Um, I saw this whole row of um, books in the psychology section um, that were using fairy tales to help people understand who they were. And they were books, some of which you may have heard of, like um, Women Who Run With The Wolves and The Cinderella Complex and all that kind of stuff. And so I just thought, that's it. And I had this image of a, a, a fairy tale character a wolf reading a book, trying to understand his nature, trying to understand his psychology and getting therapy so that he wouldn't want to eat this woman he'd fallen in love with. And that was really the beginning for it. And after that, that's such a powerful idea for me. You see, it runs and runs. It's not a story like, oh, and I'll have a bank heist at the beginning and we'll have this at the end. It's just like, that's not possible. You can't have a love story. Uh, with, with someone who starts out wanting to eat the object of his affections. Uh, um, Kayla says, the scene where Wolf is running to wake Virginia and Tony up after they fall asleep on the Mushroom Island is my absolute favourite. Yeah, I like it too. And that set, somebody made a comment uh, during the day about uh, the sets. That was an incredible set. I remember going to um, Pinewood and, and seeing that 
set and that's something as well because as a writer you largely work in you know room like this you know and you're typing away and you sort of think oh maybe it'll get made and maybe they'll do a nice set and then i walked onto that and i thought oh, oh it really is a swamp and it's so beautiful love love that whole sequence um and it's also it's it's doing what i love most which is colliding very serious emotions and some real psychology with just utterly stupid things you know the mushrooms but at the same time the mushrooms lead you at a point where you're dying that's that's what i like that's my thing was there a particular reason you chose wolves as opposed to some other animal i think it was coming out for fairy stories and i was thinking of um uh, red riding hood that's that's it um and i think that the fairy tales are uh usually about sexuality and the emergence you know so many children getting lost in the forest uh um the danger to um girls of meeting strangers and meeting these characters these men who might be dangerous you know particularly a, a, a talking point uh, in our current culture and the examination of what this this means um masculinity and how much you know what kind of partner do you want do you want somebody who's like you or do you want somebody who's a bit different and a bit dangerous and i i think that enabled me to explore that and also i'm not really a wolf so it's quite exciting for me to write a character who just says whatever they you know want to say all right balthazar i said i just found the petition for 10k2 and signed it and shared it good don't ever give up on that guys i know that it may seem like sometimes nothing's happening but we are trying and those numbers and those people and that interest is very helpful um it, it, it really makes a difference for us to be able to come in and they go well why do we want to make this series it was so long ago and i can say yeah but look look at the passion and the uh, love that people still have for the series um dominique is candy okay i could never quite tell where the wolf was trying to seduce or threaten virginia's information out of her yes i know that whole early stuff i mean it's dark isn't it but i see i i thought i couldn't escape that the fairy stories don't let you off the hook they don't say don't worry it's not dangerous so for me no i don't think wolf ate candy or killed candy or anything else but i think that his playfulness like when he's, he's cooking grandma i mean it's awful isn't it, it doesn't matter if he's, it's a joke so for me uh uh what what got me off the hook a bit was that i always thought that i didn't need to make my mind up with wolf whether he was bad or good even at any particular moment it's just the idea it, and, and and that's why you see him early on saying i shouldn't be doing this you know <laughs> he's, he's grinding the pepper over grandma and the stale dry herbs and saying i shouldn't be doing this and you can see that he's wrestling with these two different aspects of his personality and um that's that's where i like it so i like the fact that you're never quite told you know there's not some voice that comes on and you see candy afterwards and you think oh gosh that's fine there's some little bit of you that's thinking is she all right um but no it wasn't my intention that we thought that we were fitting that all right um Desiree, I'm going to have to turn in, but I am an aspiring writer. Good for you. And that movie just hit me on a personal level. I re related to Virginia's arc in a special way, and it allowed me to focus on my own vulnerabilities when I write instead of thinking what is popular. Fantastic comment. For all of you out there who are writing, please do that. That's your currency. If you write about yourself, albeit in a fantasy form, albeit, you know, abstracted or something like that, that's your currency. So, I can't go in for a job and say, I'm the best person in the world to do that job. But I can say, I'm the best person in the world to write the 10th kingdom. 
because I'm going to write it about things which mean something to me. And that's, that's really your expertise. And that's, you know, you see so much TV and I often work with a lot of uh, uh, writers and aspiring writers and new writers. And I try and move their focus away from what's popular, what works, what the executives want to hear. And instead just say to them, you're going to spend maybe several years of your life working on this if it happens. It's, you've got to care about it. It's got to be something you, you, you want to do. Otherwise, you're just going to copy, you know, and then you get into this thing where you watch a TV program and it's a copy of a copy. And that program is in itself a copy. And so it's like a photocopying machine that's running out of ink. It's, yes, there's a picture, but it kind of gets fainter. And then every so often you hear or see this really original voice or an actor who does things differently and, and it's electrifying. So uh, if you're still awake, Desiree, and you haven't gone to bed, that's, that's great. Um, focus on your vulnerabilities. That's what great actors do as well. You know, that's why they are so fragile at some level is because they're really giving you um, uncertainty rather than certainty. Um, Balthazar, I hope this video is posted on Facebook later to rewatch. I started it about 35 minutes in. I hope it is too. I don't know, but we'll see. Um, yeah, there's a few other people dropping off now. I have to go and get some sleep. Um, Douglas. Okay, Simon. Okay, as you know, I'm a big troll fan. What? You, Doug? Troll fan? Will there be trolls in 10k too? Come on, does a bear in the woods. The trolls, oh, I can't tell you everything, but the trolls have such a fantastic job. I mean, all I will say is, remember how we left them without a dad, but the heirs to the troll kingdom. Can you imagine how those three are going to, you know, run things? what they decided after a lot of fighting was that they would take it in turns to wear the crown that's all i'm gonna say doug but just every hour on the hour there's a new ruler of the troll kingdom all right kelsey i have to say i love saying suck an elf especially when people don't know why me too this um i'm very interested in swearing in drama right i don't mind something you know you watch a Martin Scorsese film and they're going to say all this, you know, 200 times or whatever. That's, that's great. I don't have a problem. Also, I don't have a problem with people who don't like it at all and don't want any of it. But there's a real skill to making up swear words which sound rude. Because if it doesn't sound rude, it's not a really good one. And suck an elf is it's whatever you want to make it. But um, when I got that or some other things <laughs> so I won't go. there's a bit where the prison governor says what in the ferrying forest or something like that there are fairies there are forests you know it's just it's fun um kayla there should be a meet and greet with the cast yes please i know but people watch it from all around the world it's just a question of where but that would be great Kirsty, Atkin Banks, morning from the UK. I love 10K. 10K, thanks for this. Thank you for joining us. I shall be going to the UK in about a month. That's great with the time. Yes, of course, time change. All right. Amanda says, do the pardoned wolves repopulate Beantown and the surrounding areas affected by the Troll King's rampage? Well, the pardoned wolves are still wolves and old prejudices die hard. And controlling the wolves, civilizing the wolves, encouraging the wolves to participate as, if you like, normal members of the kingdoms is not as easy as it sounds. 
but in part two when um wolf gets to meet his father the oh i won't tell you any of that <laughs> but there's a place called gray burrows where the wolves hang out and by hang out i mean the tails hang out and they are much more wolf-like than they are in uh, normal company and i think that's all i can say all right <clears throat> Lane, Simon, I was nine when your show aired originally. I now get to watch it with my eight-year-old daughter. We appreciate the masterpiece you've created. Thank you. It is our favorite thing to watch, and we do watch it every two months or so. We love what you do, and take out time of your day to be part of this group. Thank you. Um, I've said this before, but the fact that people watch it again and again, it's just, that's what's so fantastic, because a lot of our entertainment is throwaway. You hear something and you hear that pop song, it's pretty good, and you hear it for three weeks and then you, you're done. So the thought that people can go back to this again and again is great. And I think that's where the depth is, um, not just in the storytelling, but in the wonderful, you know, the costumes, the extras, the little jokes. There's there's a lot to take in first time around. And um, so I love it when people say, you know, they, they watch it again and again. Um, uh, Matthew says, why was the scene where the trolls are pardon cut? Just length. Uh, the episode was too long and particularly at the end there, I felt that when we assembled it all, there was a bit of a procession of these people come and then these people come and these people come. But it's my intention if we get to make the um, uh, 10K2 that we will use anything and everything we have from the first part. So imagine that as a flashback with all our, our trolls present day, we can see that scene. If we make the sequel, I will find some way to get that scene in. Okay. Will we, uh, Stephanie says, will we hear more about Clayface the Goblin in the sequel? Yes. What do you think his reaction was to the kingdoms being saved as he predicted? Um, one of my ideas for the sequel is that when the child of Virginia and Wolf goes back. Oh, I'm telling you all this stuff now. I'm sorry, I swore I wasn't going to tell you, but when she goes back to the kingdoms and finds that all the things that she thought were just fairy stories being told to her when she was a kid are really real, she sees that statue, the little statue that we saw, only now it's huge and it's in a public square. So it's like one of those, you know, war memorial kind of things. So imagine you go there and you've heard all this nonsense where your parents have said, we're not really ordinary people. You know, your dad's a half wolf and I've saved the kingdoms and all that. And you go, yeah, yeah, mum, yeah, yeah, dad, and everything like that. You go back to this place and then you see statues before that save the kingdoms. So I can promise you that in the sequel, pretty much everything that you saw in the first part will be addressed in some form or not and Clayface will certainly return. Um, Tiana says, no, most of us will stay all night. Okay. Um, Kylie Smith, I was seven years old when the Tenth Kingdom series came out. It was so extremely important to me and I'd just like to personally thank you for bringing it to life. It brought magic to my childhood and has had a very positive influence on my life. Oh, thank you so much, Kylie. That's just a wonderful thing. Thank you. Guillermo, uh, I love saying what in the fairy and forest are you doing? Yes, I do too. Oh, especially to my mum's three cats, since they're all mischievous. I think that's the perfect audience. Um, is the sequel a 10 hour miniseries as well? Uh, yes. It is, and I planned it out in 10 parts, but to be honest, if you said it was an eight part series, I'd go, yeah, yeah, it's an eight part series as well. I just love to do it. Um, okay, I think I'm almost up to date. Does anybody have any more questions? Wendy says, um, what were your favorite memories from filming? 
Um, I think probably I wasn't there for a lot of the uh, European um, uh, filming because I was working on another project. Um, but I was there for most of the um, uh, studio filming, and I think probably it was what I was saying a minute ago when I saw the um, the swamp. I just I, I, it, it, the scale of what we were doing suddenly hit me, and I just thought, oh, this is going to look so so amazing. But it's very thrilling as well. I don't think it's anything you know. I had a run where I, I was involved in quite a lot of big productions and I never lost that feeling that you would if you were just I don't know a tourist doing a studio tour or something like that and you just think oh my god they they built it they actually did it sometimes I just think I just wrote that I didn't imagine you would actually fill a whole enormous soundstage you know and uh, you know like um like a James Bond's sort of size uh, uh soundstage with um, uh, a swamp so that was probably my favorite bit um uh matthew says what role will wolf and virginia's daughter play in the sequel or is it a secret it's a secret i said too much already um tiana says is there anything else we can get can do to get the sequel made well, um, uh, the most difficult thing with something after all this time is to convince people that there's a passion for it and the interest in it. So every time that people sign one of these petitions or write into people or, um, you know, boost the DVD sales and everything like that, it's all more ammunition for us. It's all very very helpful um when we go and try and pitch it to people um i'll finish up in a second and i'll tell you what i can about where we're at uh with, with 10th kingdom but um it's not like on any given day you can do something that will make it happen but by participating in all the thing that things that wendy and the team does these are all really helpful um and um the last time we went in to pitch the series and try and uh, uh, persuade sonar to make it um you know a big part of that pitch is talking about the fans and how important it has been for people and and um how different it is uh from most of the things they're made tiffany says if you made the sequel now um uh sorry if you made the, the the sequel now what actress would you love to play their daughter uh for me that again that would be like starting from scratch i wouldn't i wouldn't say oh i want her or something i just i want to get scott and kim in a room and then see the brightest and finest most brilliant young actors and see where the chemistry was um one of the references that uh, Scott brought into when we were talking about the series uh, last time around was um, Logan, which I thought was a terrific film and a really interesting way to um, uh, revisit that um, that world. Um, and I thought the actor in that was pretty fantastic. Uh, Brit Smith, is there any bit of lore or part of the kingdoms that you didn't get to address before that you'd be excited to bring out into the sequel? Loads and loads and loads of stuff. I can't tell you how many of that because the, the breadth of the source material is so wide. Um, but if I had to pick one thing, it was uh, it would be um, uh, the Red Riding Hood uh, story because, of course, it taps into wolves and um, I had this idea in my mind that, that, that the Red Riding Hood girls were not these innocent little girls skipping through the forest at all, but actually highly trained operatives, like a kind of kingdom CIA. So these Riding Hood girls were being trained to um, do all kinds of nefarious uh, um, deeds throughout the kingdoms, and nobody suspects them because they're just almost like innocent victim-y kind of people um but in fact they're the complete opposite 
and that led me to think about a school where these Riding Hood girls were trained. And I imagined I'd, I'd doing a, um, a scene in a schoolroom where uh, a female teacher is teaching these girls about wolves and the danger of wolves and interacting with wolves and how evil and awful wolves are. And it just made me laugh. So that's what I would like to go into most of all. Um, will Wolf's brothers and sisters make an appearance in 10K2? Just his dad. Um, does Wolf actually shapeshift into a wolf? Uh, asks Elizabeth Sickler. Um, this was something we talked about a lot. Um, and you can see in Little Lamb Village that there are some transformations um, that occur because we felt we wanted something. But I didn't want, particularly with an actor of the caliber of Scott, for him suddenly to become a sort of, you know, hairy monster or something. So for me, Wolf is more a description of a type of behavior than the fact that they're actually, you know, wolf men who go on all fours and things like that it's not a werewolf story for me and i think also in the intervening period there have been so many werewolf stuff that i i would stay away from that i always saw wolf as as fundamentally a sort of human being and even when we're talking about his wolf nature it's not quite the same as saying that in the full moon he turns into a wolf um Emma volunteers to edit the sequel for free. Thank you, Emma. Careful what you wish for. Okay. Um, Emma, I am cracking up. Good. That's how you want to be. Um, did you have any input on the actors' costumes? Uh, asks Andis. Um, no, I didn't really. The only thing that we did do, what happens just before you start filming, is you look at the basic costumes. And of course, this was very, very critical because um, in, in our story, not everybody, but uh, uh, Virginia and, uh, you know, her father are basically going to wear the same clothes for the whole 10 hours. So you've, you've got to be very careful about that. The first costume I saw Virginia in I thought was completely wrong it was old school um, fairy story and um, so we had a, I remember us having a big discussion about that and just modernizing her slightly um, but otherwise no the, the costumes were not something that I had a lot to do with apart from maybe some uh, uh, notes about them in the script okay so I think I'm going to wind things up but I will tell you just a little bit in, in finishing where we're at with Tenth Kingdom 2 um, Scott and I have been trying for many years to get it set up and as I've talked uh, a little bit earlier this evening um, I always wanted to wait until we had a chance to do justice to the first series I didn't want to just do something for the sake of doing it and then find that um, it was diluting the um, the impact of, of the original story but I always imagined it, um, you know, as this big epic series and that each um, season would uh, take us fundamentally to a different kingdom. So um, I've been very, very enthusiastic about doing that. And so is Scott. Um, but our problem is that we don't possess the rights. We have to persuade somebody to do a remake of a series um that happened 19 years ago and as many of you know it didn't get great ratings when it first went out um subsequently it's done very very well on repeat showings on dvd and things like that and so that's a powerful argument for us but it's not something where um uh it's obvious that uh, we'll make it again and we'll, we'll do a sequel so it's a very hard battle um also, as some of you probably know, the personnel change a lot in TV companies. So you get very far along the line. Somebody says, yes, I'm interested. Can you come back with some ideas? So you pitch a series idea and they go, well, I like this, but I don't like this. And come back and it's three months more, six months before you get another meeting and you do that. So I felt we've got reasonably near a few times, but never quite got over that finishing line. Um, and... Uh, the fact that there have been a number of other series based on fairy tales is helpful at one level, but also not so helpful at another level because people are like, well, it's not such an original idea anymore. Um, last year, we had a really big push to try and make it happen. 
um, and there was a new uh, head of drama at Sonar um, and we went and pitched the idea and showed lots of visual stuff and um, thoughts for the second series and as I was saying earlier um, uh, told them how much there was still this very active excited fan base who would uh, uh, spread the word about the series and um, I felt we were getting somewhere um, but it's in their it's in their back catalogue so Sonar this company basically bought all the uh, uh, Hallmark projects so they had no particular incentive to make it um, and we have to push them over that hurdle uh, the last meeting we had they said um, the head of drama uh, basically said well I like the idea but and this was relayed to me afterwards and I shouldn't really tell you this but I will tell you this because you know, all my friends and the loyal fans um, and they were saying but I'm not sure, you know, Simon's the right person to write it and maybe we should get somewhere young, someone younger, you know, to do it and have a fresh look at it. And I took this over with Scott afterwards and I said, well, look, you know, maybe we could go in this direction and we could, um, you know, make the series happen. But I don't want to do it. I don't want this to just suddenly, you know, the Tenth Kingdom come back and people go, oh, it's great. And then suddenly it's something else. It has a different voice. It's about different things. Um, I'm afraid for me, I would rather not make the series than make it in the wrong way or make it with the wrong people. And, you know, it's not just one decision as well. You know, maybe they would say, oh, well, we'll get some hot, you know, 25-year-old uh, writer from some sitcom to work with you or something like that but then it begins a process and as I said to you then the next message you get is oh we think Scott's a great actor but you know maybe he's too old to play the lead or whatever so um, I I feel such love and warmth and affection for this series that I will always always be ready at the drop of a hat to do a, a sequel or sequels to it but I won't do it unless um, I find somebody who really wants to make it. So at the moment, we're kind of stuck in a holding pattern of some interest, but not really the interest that's going to get it made. But in the time that we've been trying to set up the series, there have been three different heads of drama <laughs> at the same company. So um, I'm still very hopeful that one day we will meet somebody who, like you, saw the series when they were young and loves it and says, go ahead. And when we get that day, we will make it. You'll be the first to know. And um, uh, I, I'd be very, very excited to carry on this story. I can't tell you how many ideas and thoughts I have. And uh, um, and I, But I want it to be faithful to the first one. I want it to be faithful and not just recast characters and make up a whole new mythology, um, but really try and tell that story. That's as honest as I can be without saying more things that I shouldn't say. Okay, thank you. Yes, a few people saying only Simon. So yes, it should only be Simon. It should only be me. I know, maybe it would be like somebody. Hey, Wolf's back, but <laughs> he's being played by I don't know somebody else. All right. Um, thank you. I will not watch it ever if they do that. Never. All right. Laura Harting Lemon, when I start my own company, I will back you and Scott to the moon and back. Thank you. We will travel to the moon and back. Yes, Kelsey, always looking for someone young and new. Yes, sometimes the originals are best for the job. I hope they realize that. Well, I hope they do too. Okay, I think it's time to wrap things up. Um, I'm going to have a look and see if there are any last questions, and then I'm going to say goodnight to you all. Um, Elizabeth, as another aspiring author, I was really inspired by The Tenth Kingdom and it's why I prefer to write in the fairy tale genre. To this day, it is my absolute favorite movie and book. Thank you so much for taking time to chat with us and answer our questions. Cripes! But I cannot thank you enough for giving us... Oh, people are writing, it's disappearing. I cannot thank you enough for giving us The Tenth Kingdom. Lots of love and wolf howls. Oh, Scott does that better than me. Um, okay. When will you host another live chat? Well, I think that should wait. I think we'd see, but next year is 20 years, so we've got to do something nice. 
Wendy, thank you, Simon, for being here with us. We'll see you again soon. Lots of love. Wendy, thank you for being here and thank everybody else. I can't, if I start naming names, then I'll forget some people and they'll be upset. But when I say thank you, Wendy and the team, I mean everybody who's made this week and keeps the whole thing alive. Thank you so much. Good night. I love you all. Bye-bye.